So, what we're doing tonight is the usual uh, quarterly, that's not right, that means it's four times a year. <laughs> um, every fourth one, have you say that? <laughs> monthly. Um, monthly. Monthly-ish, yeah, that'll do. Uh, monthly kind of recap of the last subjects we've covered. So, those subjects um, in reverse order, I suppose, are reverses was last week, suit establishment was the week before that, and splinters was the week before that. So I'm going to cover them in the order we covered them, but I don't mind chopping and changing. So what I'm going to look at first is splinters. So what a splinter is, essentially, is um, a strong way of agreeing your partner's suit. Now, <coughs> the idea behind a splinter is to try and possibly investigate something more than just gain. So the reason you have a problem with just classic bidding with decent hands, let's say 14, 15 points opposite an opening hand, is that you're in the kind of unknown area as to whether a slam is on or not. So splinters and jacoby and game forcing raises, however you game force, are all trying to combat the problem of this kind of hand. Now if you look at the north hand, if you didn't play anything fancy, you would have to just bid four hearts on that hand because you think game is on, you don't know slam is on, your hand isn't really good enough to bid four no trumps. So you're in that kind of an awkward middle zone where four hearts is definitely safe and arguably not enough, but six hearts is definitely not safe and arguably too much. So you're in the kind of middle ground. So what splinters is, it's a branch of the tree of those kind of bits. Jacoby two no trumps is another version of it. Um, and any other way you can gain force if you open two clubs, control bidding, they're all along the same vein. What we're looking for really is slams. It's a slam orientated <coughs> bit. And by, by inference, therefore, it's a game-forcing bid in itself. Because if you're looking for a slam, you are assuming the game is a reasonable bet. If you don't make game, then you shouldn't be splintering at all. So that's why it's kind of slam orientated. Now, what a splinter aims to solve is the, not problem, that's the wrong word, but the advantage of shape. A splinter tries to represent shape as a way of finding a slam based on your shortages rather than just your firepower, just your sheer points. So what a splinter does is it says, I have very few cards in this suit. Does that suit you? Haha, <laughs> suit you. Um, does that m gel well with your hand that I have a shortage in this suit? Because if so, we might have a slam on. And if not, we'll settle for game. That's what a splinter is trying to say. That's the generic message. So what we do with a shortage in a side suit <coughs> is that we jump in that side suit. But we can't single jump because that is still natural. For example, if we bid two clubs with this hand, or three clubs, both of those are clubs of some description. Two clubs is natural and forcing, three clubs is whatever you agree, weak jump shift, strong jump shift, fit jump, whatever you agree, it's still clubs of some description. We need those two bids to be clubs because you need a way of being good with clubs and bad with clubs or vice versa depending on whether you play strong jump shifts or weak jump shifts. The point is you need two bids to show clubs essentially, to define between good with clubs or average with clubs. But you don't really need four clubs, or, or rather, a double jump in any suit. You don't need three spades, or four diamonds, or four clubs to be. I have billions and billions and billions of them, because these two bids really satisfy however many clubs, or whatever suit you're bidding, you'd like to bid. So what we do is, we use this double jump as our splinter bid. So you agree that a double jump in a side suit is something artificial. And it in fact is the opposite, I've got millions and millions and millions of them, it's I have one or fewer of these. So I think the word splinter comes from the, the derivation of fragment, when you have a single card in a suit, so it's sometimes referred to as a fragment, so, I've, so a splinter comes from that, I'm not really sure though. But what it says is, I have one or fewer of these cards, and I think game is the minimum we can make. That's kind of by the by, because whether you want to be in game or not, it's too late now, because four hearts is the smallest number of hearts you can escape in. So it has to be game forcing just by the nature of it being a double jump. By double jumping, you are going to game now, because you have bypassed three hearts, whatever suit you double jump in, or three of whatever suit you're agreeing. So in this instance, that says, I have a singleton club, I have a heart fit, a singleton or void club, I should say, I have a heart fit, and I'm interested in slap. And that doesn't mean I am definitely going for slam, nor does it mean I don't want to go for slam at all. If you didn't think slam was on at all, you would just bid game. There's no kind of reason really to splinter as routine, you only splinter if you think some things are. Now based on our hand, our partner needs quite specific cards for a slam to be on, and the splinter is a very descriptive bid. 
So as if a slam is on, a splinter is the correct way to describe our hand, we would like our partner to have not many points in clubs. Because the more points they have in clubs, the more useless our singleton is. If our partner's got ace-king-queen of clubs, we might as well not have that singleton. Because the ace-king-queen's going to deal with, them, with the clubs. Whereas if our partner's got four small clubs, our singleton is incredibly useful to them. Because their four club losers have gone from four to one because of our shortage. So the splinter describing your hand is, is, is very, it, when it comes up is very good because it is very precise. I have a fit for you, we have game and I have shortage in this very suit. And when you can do that, you then get to some uh, kind of low point slams, 26, 27 point slams because of your shape, because your partner's hands match. Therefore, when your partner does do a splinter, you look at the splinter suit itself, so in this instance clubs, you look at your club holding. The more points you've got in clubs, the less suited your hand is for a slam. The less points you've got in clubs, or rather the fewer points you've got in clubs, the better suited your hand is for slam, based on your partner's bid. So the perfect holding, really, is as I've said, something like that. Where you've got stacks, and I suppose that's not perfection, perfection, because the ace of clubs with no others would be good as well. Um, that is very good because all of your points, assuming you've got an opening hand, which you should have, given that you've opened the bidding, all of your opening points are in these three suits, which sort of has to be something like ace of hearts, king of diamonds, king of spades, and even then that's not an opening hand. So you can see how a slam can be made on fairly low points now, because all of the points in clubs are irrelevant, or close to irrelevant. There's something known as the 30-point pack. And what that means is if you can discount 10 points in one of the suits because of your shape, suddenly slams can be made on a lot, a lot fewer than 30 odd points because there's only 30 relevant points. In this instance, the 10 points in clubs that the opponents have aren't going to do them much good. They're only going to take one trick. So that's what Splinter is trying to get across these low point slams based on your shape. However, if you hold, so with that hand, with four small clubs and a good goodies in the other suits, I would be four no trumps or four diamonds if you play control bidding. It's up to you. But I would be interested in slam. If you have points in your club suit, especially not the ace, the ace tends to be okay because it deals with part and singleton. But if you've got points in the, in the club suit, or rather the splinter suit, that's not very good now. Because your king and jack sort of might as well not be there. Because the ace of clubs is going to lose, because they've got the ace, they're unlikely not to take the ace. And then, yes, you might make your king, but you could have trumped all three of those clubs anyway. So it's sort of a bit of, it's what's known as wasted values or waste paper. You, you might as well not have that king of clubs. You want that three points elsewhere in your hand. The king of diamonds is a very good card opposite our partner's hand. The king of clubs is not a very good card. King of spades is even better still. Do you see what I mean? And that's because this splinter does not suit your hand. Because your losers haven't really diminished. You had one, well you had more than one losers in clubs on your own. But your partner's splinter hasn't really helped you a lot, because your values are now wasted. If we convert that four points into the ace and the ace only, so ace to four instead, now you can see again that that is now working for you. So the ace is quite a good card, anything else is irrelevant. So ace jack to four is worth ace to four, ace queen to four is worth ace to four because you're never going to make that queen or jack, so you might as well not have it. So when your partner makes a splinter, you look at the splinter suit. If you like that, if you have very few points, the ace only or no points at all, good, carry on. If you don't like that, sign off in game. Okay? Yes? So, um, don't splinter with the ace in north. <clears throat> yes. There is, now this is not contentious because almost everyone agrees with me, but there's, it's, it's, it's hard to convince you of why this is the case, but you just sort of semi got to take my word for it. Um, but if you have a single today, the reason it's not good to splinter is because your partner devalues king queens. Hi, Pete. Uh, yeah. So, um, if your partner has king queen to four clubs, they are rating you to hold a singleton small one, which means their king queen's not very good. Whereas actually opposite a singleton ace, whilst you'd rather they had ace to three or something, opposite a singleton ace, king queen's not actually bad. So the reason you don't splinter with singleton aces, and in my opinion singleton kings, but that's getting close to the line, is because partner down, downgrades something that actually might be good. 
So they treat their King Jack to four clubs as not very good when actually King Jack to four clubs opposite singleton ace is decent. You follow me? Yeah. Okay. Any questions on sports? Yeah, intervention. Yes. So intervention, uh, you sort of ignore them, um, yeah. but if they intervene with a big jump, one heart, three spades, four clubs has got to be natural because you need some natural clubs. So depends how much they intervene. Okay. If they intervene with the splinter suit, you can ignore them. Once one heart, two clubs, four clubs is still a splinter, obviously, because they haven't got, you haven't, you haven't got a natural need for it now. Uh, if they do a big preemptive intervention, you sort of lose splinters, I'm afraid. And double? Uh, double would, if they intervene, if they do a big preemptive intervention, double would probably be your best bet as to try and no, force I mean, if, they if they double the splinter, just carry on as normal, really. So basically? Yeah, pretty much ignore them. Um, if they double the splinter, it's because they want it lead. But then, of course, you've got a singleton, so you don't need to worry about it because you've only got one in that suit, so they're unlikely to be cashing. I suppose it's if you try and finish in no trumps, but I don't know why you would, because you've got because you've got a fit. Okay, right. Now, next one. Let's see if would I you, can. Would you do a splinter if you had two gloves? No, you need singleton or fewer. Singleton. Yeah, two cards is considered shortage, but for splinter's sake, you need one or fewer, really. Um, avoid splinter is obviously better than a singleton, but it's probably 10 to 1, it's, more, it's a singleton nearly always. Yeah. So if you treat your partner with a small singleton, that's, that's about right most of the time. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, I guess yeah. the lesson, that's right. That's okay. So, so do you continue with um, control bidding after yeah. this? Yeah, if you, if you like control bidding, that's the way. If, you, if you're not comfortable, then four no trumps is a fine route as well. What do you do with voids if you're not Four no trumps doesn't really work with voids, that's why control bidding is strictly better. Okay. If you're you know, well versed at it, it's strictly better, especially with splinters. Um, now, let's look at suit establishment. I'll try and make it so that we can use that hand still. So that'll, be, that'll be interesting, won't it? some more investigating see if a grand slams on but I can't be bothered. Um, so after this splinter sequence we now end up playing the contract. Now suit establishment what that is is essentially one of your two paths as to playing. So it's talking about playing in a trump contract. It can be playing in a no trump contract as well. When you play in a no trump contract you suit establishment is kind of the only real way you can go about it. You play on your long suit. You'll have heard me say that ever since I ever first spoke about no trump play. Play on your long suit, where your tricks come from, play on that suit. That's known as establishing a suit. What it means really is making it so that the little cards in that suit are winners. Because the opponents have run out and therefore that little whatever it is, is a winner. There is an assumption that A, the suit breaks somewhat kindly so that the opponent doesn't have more slash as many as you do. And the second assumption is that they can't trump it. Because if you've made your little three of diamonds a winner but there's still trumps out, they're likely to use the trump on that little three of diamonds winner. So a suit establishment in no trumps is fairly routine. You play on your long suit and there is no trumps to worry about, so you just keep playing on your long suit until they stop playing, i.e. they run out, trump element. So you have to draw the trumps and play on your side suit in kind of a, kind of a hybrid manner, if you will. Now, um, oh, I, need, I need that out of the way, sorry. So a suit establishment, what that says is, you play on your trumps until the opponents have run out of trumps, and then you play on your next longest side suit until that is winners as well, based on length. So what you're doing really is you're pulling the trumps off them and then playing it a bit like you'd play it in no trumps. Play on your longest suit. So that's kind of how you can play a trump contract. Pull the trumps off them, and then you've got a couple of trumps left. Leave them now, and then play on your next longest suit. That is one of the two ways to make trump contracts. Pull the trumps, play your long side suit. With the trump suit as kind of your safety net, should anything go wrong, they get the lead, you can trump in at some stage to regain the lead. That's the idea. It's either that way, or make tricks out of your trumps. Trump a club here, trump a diamond there, trump a club here, so on and so forth. You can do that as well, i.e. a cross rough. 
Um, they're kind of your two different paths. You draw the trumps playing your nice long suit, or you use your trumps independently, taking some risks that the opponents will over-trump you. Some small risks. Now, in this particular hand, we ended up in six hearts. There are two paths, really. You can either trump all three clubs in the dummy, making this hand only have one loser, the slow diamond. Or, you draw the trumps and attempt to establish your next longest suit, which in this case would be spades. So you can either draw the trumps, play on the spades, or try and trump all three of these clubs in the dummy, i.e. exploiting dummy shortage. They're your two paths. Whenever you play a trump contract, they are essentially your two only, one of your two choices. Draw the trumps and play on X, or don't draw the trumps because you're roughing Y. That's about it, really. Now that is oversimplifying it because there's a lot of complications about whether you can draw the trumps, where your entries are and all that jazz. But they are really ultimately the only two ways you can go. So in this instance, let's say we play it on a suit establishment. What that means is you look to draw the trumps to then establish your second best suit. In this instance, spades. Okay? So what I'm going to do is play it as if it were on a suit establishment to see how it goes. Now notice, a suit establishment, you need some reasonable fortune. I don't want to call it good fortune, but you need some gen, you know, normal breaks. If the spades are 5-1, the, the suit is not going to be established, because that person, whoever they are, has too many spades. So you try and establish it, it, it won't work, because they just keep beating your spades. Whereas if the suit is divided 3-3, three and three, that will work because once you've played them three times, those two spades left on the dummy, or in hand, depending on which hand's playing it, um, will be winners. So that's what a suit establishment is about. Now, it's easy for me, because when I, put the, when I play this on the board, I'm going to make things break so I have a chance. If you happen to play on a suit establishment, and you find a side suit is breaking 5-1, or 6-0, or something horrific, then it's time to change plan. Now, that does, you might not have another plan. You might just be going off. That can happen. But I'm going to play it as if I have a chance that the cards have been dealt relatively in my favour. Not explicitly, but relatively. So if we were to play this on a suit establishment, what we would like to do is win the lead, which we can do whatever suit they lead, knock the trumps out, and then play on the spades. Counting is your friend. Suit establishment is all about counting to 13. Now it sounds daft, obviously, you're going to count to 13. But you only count to 13 in the suits that are actually important to you. For example, I don't really care how many diamonds have gone because it's not really my suit. I'm never going to make that ten of diamonds unless the opponents do something exceptionally unusual. And I'm never really going to make any baby clubs. So the only suits I really care about are the major suits in this particular instance. I care about how many hearts have gone, because they're trumps, and I care about how many spades have gone, because that's the suit I'm looking to set up. Okay? So let's say they need something that doesn't help me. A diamond is the worst, because they knock out your ace immediately, which means they have established a diamond winner for themselves. So that's the best lead they can do. Uh, notice, if they were to lead a spade against me here, I would sense that the suit isn't establishing. Because why have they led a spade? The most like, strongest likelihood is that they're short in spades. That's the most likely thing. Because otherwise, why haven't they led one of their good minor suits? They're doing something bad. Anyway, don't worry about that. So they lead a diamond, uh, we win the ace on the dummy. Now as I say, there are two routes here. You can play a club, trump a club, get back to hand, trump a club, get back to hand, trump a club. That's one alternative. And once you've done all that, then draw the trumps. Or your other alternative is draw the trumps and play on your spades. Out of interest, the club route is probably slightly better, but I'm going to play it on the suit establishment just to kind of show you how it works. But roughing clubs is probably slightly more likely to work, but it, it, it'll be close. Um, so, draw the trumps. Uh, ace of hearts, everyone follows. Low heart to the king. Um, Let's say one person shows out, so we've had a 4 and a 3, that's 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, so someone's still got a trump left, so draw the trump. Uh, it's good to keep entries in the suit hand, the hand with the long suit, which is good practice. Uh, so draw the final trump, and now play a suit establishment, i.e. play on your spades. We've counted the trumps, once you've done that, you can kind of forget that, because trumps are drawn, box ticked, forget that, you don't need to worry about how many they had to begin with, because trumps are now drawn. The next thing you need to do is count the spades. Now again, I've made it somewhat easy for myself that I could draw the trumps without much stress, I could just play my ace, king, queen, or ace, king, jack in this instance, and I've made it that I could draw all the trumps, I didn't need the trumps as entries in the yada yada. 
It could be that you need to use the trump to get over there to play your side suit, to then use the trump to get over there to play your side suit. That's when you've got to be able to count 13s at different times. That's where it gets a bit more difficult. I've made it easier for myself here, which is often why you say it looks so easy on the board, and then you see your hand and um, I do give it. I do give myself reasonable chances. So we play the king of spades. Again, highest from shortest. That's always a good card play technique. The reason for that is when we win the ace of spades on the next round, we are then going to have the lead in the correct place to continue playing spades. Okay? So everyone plays a spade. Spade to the ace. Everyone plays a spade. That's eight, nine, ten, eleven, because we've got three in the dummy. So if we play a low spade, if everyone plays a spade, we play a low spade, they play a spade, we rough it. If they play all the spades, if everyone plays a spade, i.e. we get a nice side suit break, this suit establishment is going to function. Because now these two spades are the last two spades in the deck. It doesn't matter that the jack is good and the seven is not as good, because they're both equivalent now, because they're the last cards in the deck. What we now need to do is get the lead back to dummy. Now, as I say, if the spades had broken nastily, this wouldn't have worked. So, you know, there's, there's choices. Um, we get the lead back to dummy by playing the ace of clubs, getting rid of this club. And we play a low club, trumping it in the dummy, and then you cash these two winning spades that you've established. That's the idea behind it. So I made spades break nicely and trumps break kind of all right. If trumps break... Kind of alright, spades break badly, it wouldn't have worked, or if trumps break really badly, then you might need to draw four rounds and all that jazz. Mm. As I say, with this particular hand, it probably would have been better to trump a club, come to hand, trump a club, come to hand, trump a club. That seems fairly easy as well, if you had a choice in this instance. That's all really suit establishment is. Draw the trumps, if there are any, and then play any longer side suit, and count them. Okay? Yeah? Questions on suit establishment before I move to the last one? No? Right. Okay, so the principle of reverses. Now, what reverses are is a kind of a bidding agreement between you and your partner. Now, when I very, very first taught you how to bid, right from the very instance of if you're unbalanced, you open your longest suit, then you bid your next suit, and so on and so forth, I completely, on purpose, ignored reversed suits. Now, what reversed suits are is when your second suit, the suit you want to bid second, i.e. your four-card suit, when you have five and four, when your four card suit is higher ranking than your primary suit. So in this instance, we have four hearts and five diamonds. So when your second suit is higher ranking than your first, they're known as reversed suits. The reason for that is that they are in the wrong order. Because when you make your rebid of two hearts, your partner, quite frequently, let's say half the time, will want to return to your primary suit because they don't like your hearts and they prefer diamonds. Quite often they'll prefer your diamonds simply because you have more of them. Quite, you know, normally they'll have kind of three diamonds, three hearts, and they're like, mm. but they prefer diamonds because you've got five of them, not four of them. So with reversed suits, because your second suit is higher ranking than your first, your partner cannot return to two of your initial suit. They have to return to three of your initial suit because your suits are in the opposite order. If I move a red card up, to this, these suits are now not reversed because our second suit is lower ranking than our first, so our bidding now is one heart, two diamonds. This is under the assumption that partner's bidding something, by the way, obviously. Um, now if our partner wants to return to hearts, they can do so at the two level, not the three level. So the principle of reversed suits suggests that having suits in the incorrect orientation is not good for your bidding. And it's just the way the bidding stacks up, because your second bid actually bypasses two of your initial suit. 
So there is a way of combating this problem. Now, I didn't teach you the way to combat this problem because I don't think it's a problem worth worrying about. Certainly not when you're just getting into the building anyway because it's too, it's too, too much complication at the start. So what, what people do to combat this... Oh, this isn't the problem. <laughs> what people do to combat this problem is that they say to rebid your second suit, if that second suit is higher ranking than your first, if that goes past two of your initial suit, then you need extra points. So to bid one diamond and then two hearts, you need more points. The idea being, if your partner has a really rubbish hand, they're going to have to put you back to the three level, so you need the extra firepower to make up for the fact that you are a level higher than you might have otherwise been. So with this hand, we don't have the extra points. So what those who play reverses would do, instead of rebidding two hearts, they would simply rebid their five-card suit. This starts to break down the structures of what I taught you originally in that one then two is six cards. And the reason you can do one then two is six cards is because one then two of another is five four. And I didn't bother worrying about reverses. There is the odd time, probably, oh God, I wouldn't know, one in ten, something like that, where a partner has an absolute heap of rubbish. Um, Something like, oh, that doesn't give them a response, that's not very good, is it? Uh, give them a jack of that. There is the odd time where your partner just about scraped up a one level response and has no fits for anything, and neither you have fits for anything, so no one wants to be in anything. And they've just scraped up their response. Now this is extremely pessimistic. I've had to construct carefully the kind of negative hand. But the point here is playing, not playing reverses, it goes one diamond, one spade. You have to respond to spade rather than clubs because you haven't got enough points to bid clubs. You then bid two hearts because you're not worried about reverses because I told you not to be. And then they go blip. They don't want to be in diamonds, they don't want to be in hearts, they don't want to be in clubs because there's no fit there, they don't want to be in spades because there's no fit there, they don't want to be in no trumps because they haven't got enough points. So they don't want to be in anything. So the best contract actually was one diamond. Or rather, zero diamonds, you don't really want to be in anything. I suppose one no trump might work out okay. Um, so what has happened by you entering into the bidding is actually you've created a problem. Because now the only bid you can really do is south that is, I don't want to say safe, but the only bid that you actually want to do is south is three diamonds. It's the safest thing you can do. Two no trumps would show more points, three clubs would be four suit forcing, spades would show more spades, clubs would be four suit forcing. Uh, that's about it, isn't it? Raising hearts would show some hearts. There's, there's no bid in the box that is any good for us. So that what you do is you return to their primary suit as your safest course of action. And because these suits were reversed, it means three level is the minimum you can go back to. Which is obviously absolutely gross on these cards. Three diamonds is absolutely miserable. I mean, you might make it, if diamonds are 3-3, three, three, the king is on side, the ace of hearts is on side, then you might be alright. Your chances are very slim of making three diamonds. And if they just lead club, 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 you're suddenly running out of trumps before you even started. So, it's a, a horrible, horrible contract any number of diamonds really, but three especially. So what the, re what the principle of reverses says, well at least in this instance, because you've reversed, you must have extra points, at least that will be your hand. So whilst we are in a misfit, at least I've got the points to make up for the fact that we aren't enjoying ourselves in the bidding. That's what reverses say. So there are essentially two different paths. You either play reverses and you protect yourself from the previous horrible hand, in which case rebidding one then two it's a five card suit only, because you might be five four, but you can't bid your four. Or you don't worry about reverses, you bid your five, you bid your four, and every now and again you end up in a miserable contract at the three level, rather than a miserable contract at the two level. So my argument is, whilst reverses are very good when they, when they suit the hand, it's more useful, and more often, more often useful, to be able to go one then two promising six. It's more frequently useful to have that in your, in your kind of arsenal, because when you get to competitive bidding, knowing that partner has six and not five is quite a critical thing. So what I would suggest is, whilst I've just told you what reverses are, I wouldn't personally adopt them, certainly not in pairs anyway, because you want to compete more readily.
The good thing about that is I'm actually telling you to adopt the easier route. Rather than what normally happens in bridge, I tell you to do the most difficult thing. Yes, that's the way it is. So what I would suggest is, know what reverses are, understand why they are a thing, but you don't have to play them if you don't wish. But you can play them if you want to. Um, I'm kind of by the by as to whether, I do play them with my, with my partner, but I'm kind of by the by as to whether we really should, especially in pairs, because in pairs you want to compete, and a six card suit is a big difference to a five card suit, in my opinion. Okay? Yes? If you are playing reverses and you can make your second bid at the same level, Yes. Does it have a different meaning? Um, if you are playing reverses and your suits aren't reversed, is that what you're saying? No, if they are reversed and you bid, say, for example, one club, then the response is one heart, you bid... Two diamonds. That would be One spade. Oh, I see. Okay, yes, good question. Um, if your suits are reversed, but you can get away with... Obviously, these hands don't apply now. Uh, if your suits are reversed, but you can get away with doing it at the, at the lower level, then this doesn't promise extra points. Because, and you've reminded me of something there, thank you for that, um, when you open one club, the, the safe haven, if you like, is two clubs. So as long as you don't bypass two of your initial suit, you're okay. That's what's known as the barrier, breaking the barrier, going beyond the barrier, whatever. So your barrier is two of your primary suit, in this instance, two clubs. So as long as your rebid doesn't bypass that, then you're safe whatever. So for me, this would show five clubs, four spades, and kind of 11 to 15-ish points, something like that. 11, because they're 5-4, they might have opened on the rule of 20. Um, and if they do jump to two spades, then it's the full shilling, if you like, for genuine 5-4, 16 plus, like normal. So it doesn't really change anything. You tend to find with clubs and spades, you get away with it, because often you can open a club and partner bids a red suit, and then you can bid a spade. It's only if they open a club and they rebid a no trump. Now you're in a bit of an awkward spot, but they shouldn't have four spades for that, so they should be. Um, the most problem reverse suits are when you hold uh, diamonds in a major. That happens quite a lot often, because you bid a diamond, they bid two clubs, and now you're like, bleh. That happens quite a lot. Okay? But clubs and spades, you nearly always get away with it. But if it doesn't bypass two of your suit, then yeah, you're still safe, you're fine. Playing reverses or not. Yeah? Okay? Happy, happy, yeah, good. So what I've got tonight is a kind of a, a selection. There's hands all over the place. They've got splinters, they've got suit establishments. Some, some of them have both. They've got reverses, all sorts going on. And some of them are random, okay?